Hello, Chris Godinez, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk on every Sunday here at noon on YouTube. And then I post it up to the Facebook page. This video is for educational and informational purposes only. If you feel you need a therapist, please go to Google, type in therapy, your city, psychology today will pop up, click on that, and it will have all of the therapists in your area. Also, the views and opinions stated to in are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other damn therapist for that matter. Thanks for playing. Bye-bye. All right. That is that. Somebody asked me why I do that intro every single time. It is an ACA ethics code, so I must do the intro every single time. I'm sorry if it annoys you guys. I know the regulars here know who the heck I am, but you know what? I get new people coming every day, so you know I got to do the intro every time, and I also need to let them know this is not therapy. You know, this is like just helping, and you know, if you need a therapist, you know where to go. All right. So, Hello, everybody. Let me get some announcements out of the way. So we've got some tour dates to talk about. Um, I will be March 23rd in New Orleans. Yes, we have the event space. It is up on Eventbrite. So go to Mercury, M-U-R-C-U-R-I, Eventbrite, Eventbrite, Mercury. It will be up there. Um, and that's in New Orleans, March 23rd. So if you wish to see me in New Orleans, March 23rd, that is that. July 4th, I will be speaking at the Mensa Convention, the Mensa Gathering in uh, Phoenix at the Sheraton in here in Phoenix. Uh, that's July 4th at 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, July 6th, I will be in Santa Barbara. July 13th, I will be in St. Paul, Minnesota. I think I'm in St. Paul. Yes, I'm in St. Paul, Minnesota, which will be nice because it'll be summertime, which means it'll be nice up there and really freaking hot down here. Uh, August 3rd, I will be in Anaheim, California. August 31st, San Jose. September 1st, San Francisco. September 2nd, Sacramento. October 19th is Austin, Texas. October 20th is San Antonio, Texas, because I had a couple of people asking me about that. There is a possibility that we, I may be in the Florida Keys at the end of October. Chris and I are still talking about that. We'll figure that one out, get some dates. And then December 4th, the cruise to the Bahamas. So I know people are very excited about that. So for all the information on that, go to Eventbrite, and it will have the information on the cruise there. Wow. Hi, Poland. That's awesome. Um, so, okay. So other announcements, and then I swear to God, I'll get to the issue at hand. So if you are interested in picking up these two books, they are available on Audible. I do the reading myself. Um, I also have a very talented voice actor working on this one. Um, so there is that. I read both of them. Also, they're available on hard copy from Amazon. So if you want to do that, or if you are interested in purchasing this lovely 20 ounce mug my nephew was so funny it's like i brought him a whole set of mugs and he was like this is awesome because he loves big you know hot chocolate mugs and things like that anyway so available on ebay so there it is all right there is that okay bombay india good lord you guys are all over the world that is freaking awesome all right so today what i want to talk about is self sabotage why 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 do we do this why do we sabotage ourselves? Why do we continue to go back to the abuser? Why do we not do the work? Why do we, um, you know, do things that like big adult us is kind of like, what the, why did I do that? What the heck? You know, but then little inner child us is kind of like, Wee! you know, so this is what I want to talk about. So the ways that we self-sabotage ourselves are not always super obvious. Okay. They're sneaky. It's really sneaky kid that doesn't want to do something right so it's kind of like you know go in your room i'm tired i don't have time i don't want to you know it's like it's not like a real obvious kind of sabotage but it is a sabotage so what ends up happening is is that we <laughs> if we do not work on the inner child if we do not work on that first time that we got wounded okay whether that inner child is a wee one a little one you know like two three years old or whether that inner child is a teenager or whether that inner child is you know middle school or whatever we keep going back to that frame of mind and we keep running from that particular frame of existence so if you read the pete walker book if you read the inner child workbook they both talk about this all the time and what we tend to do is working on that original wound is not for pussy ass bitches that's what i tell everybody recovery is not for people who are scared it's not and it's the same thing for recovering from 
uh, an abusive relationship. You must be brave. You must. You must. Because if you're not, you'll never do the work. So, and that's what I tell people. It's like people who are in recovery, man, props. Because it is hard work. And it is scary work. And if you are dealing with you know, little one that was abused or harmed or set up back then, that's the age frame that you're going to be thinking from. And it's terrifying. It's terrifying. So whatever age it was that the damage occurred, whether it was little, little, whether it was middle school, whether it was high school, whether it was young adult, that's where we keep going back to. And that's where the fear is. So really what ends up happening is we allow the fear to sabotage us. We allow the fear to stop us. It looks too much. It looks too overwhelming. Oh my God, this is too, I can't, right? I can't, I'm trying. So when I work with addicts, that's the two words I tell them to get the fuck out of their dictionary right the hell now. So I can't, no, it's I won't. It's a choice, people. And I love it when when professional victims sit there and go, no, it's not, no, it's not a choice. It's not, yeah, it is, it is. And I will tell this story again. So when I was out at Disneyland with my little niece, she was gesticulating, you know, talking with her hands. And she was very, very, very excited. It was very early in the morning, about seven o'clock. It was a little cold. And at one point, boom, every single water on the table went straight into my lap. Now, I had a choice at that point. I could either ruin the day and scream at the poor kid for a fucking accident, or I could laugh. And I chose to laugh. And the waiter came over to me and said, oh my God, do you know how many parents would have screamed at that poor kid and ruined the day? And I said, yeah, a lot. I'm not one of them. So it is a choice. Our emotions are a choice. Now, yes, you are going to have a knee jerk reaction because in that moment I recognized I have a choice. I can scream or I can laugh. And I chose to laugh. So our emotions are a choice. And anyone who says otherwise is either selling you something or lying. There we go. So there that is. It is a choice. That is called personal responsibility. Anything less than that, you are playing an abuser's game. You are playing the victim game. You're not a victim. You are not. You are not. You're not a victim to your emotions and you're not a victim to anybody else's emotions. You are not. It is a choice. So what we have to do is we have to start being mindful, 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 mindful. That's why I keep pushing this. It's like, what is your motivation? It sounds like an actor. What's my motivation? What is your motivation? What is your motivation for getting healthy? What is your motivation for choosing your emotions? What is your motivation for staying a victim? What is your motivation for constantly being acted upon as opposed to you acting upon your life? What's your motivation? What's the payoff? What are you getting out of constantly shooting yourself in the foot. What are you getting out of it? There's always a payoff. So get rid of the word can't, it's won't. It's not can't, it's won't. And the word try. Now this is where I'm gonna do my goddamn Yoda impersonation. Remember Yoda? They're out in the swamp, it's Dagobah, and Luke is just a whiny ass bitch, and he's like, I can't lift up this meter, it's too hard, I can't do it, I'm trying. And Yoda finally gets fed up, and I was just like, right there with you, bro. And he says, "Mm, do or do not, there is no try. There is no fucking try. There is no fucking try. You either fucking do it or you fucking don't, period. And it is, again, a choice. It's a choice. Do you want to get healthy or do you want to stay stuck? That's really what it is. And it's it's really a matter of, are you moving forward or are you moving backwards? What, what do you want? Do you want to put your life in reverse or do you want to put it in drive and rock down that highway? So really, that's what it is. And when we get stuck, you have to ask yourself, how old do I feel? How old do I feel? How overwhelmed do I feel? Do I feel like adult me or do I feel like little tiny, oh my God, I have no power me. And that's why it's important to work on the inner child. And it's so funny because I will have clients come to me and they will have literally a temper tantrum. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, this is stupid. I don't want to work on the inner child. I don't want to do that. And I'm sitting there trying not to laugh because I'm like, oh my God, you already are. How old are you? How old do you feel when you're having this temper tantrum? How old are you? When did this happen? And that's when we start working on that in the office. So it really is a matter of the inner child having a temper tantrum, being fearful. It's fear. We have this huge fear of change. And what if 
I get healthy. What is that going to look like? Oh my God, we know how to fail. We know how to fuck things up. We know how to fall on our face. We've done it our whole lives. But what if we're successful? What is that going to look like? I'll tell you what, when I first started doing all of this, I was terrified out of my fucking mind. Not because I was afraid I was going to fail. If I failed, I would have been fine with that. I really would have. It's like failure, know how to do that. There we go. You know, it wasn't the fear of the failure. It was the fear of success. Why? Well, if you've got toxic family members constantly telling you you're going to fail and that you're not smart and you're not this and you're not that. And the other thing, wow, you're going up against a whole bunch of embedded messages that it's not okay. Number one. Number two, we know how to fail. We don't know how to succeed. And it's really important to stop thinking that you have to fail. You don't. You get to succeed. And that's why I teach everybody when I do the mirror work, at the end of the day, come back, make eye contact with yourself. List three things you did right. Hi, good to see you again. Oh my gosh, great day. Here are three things you did right. And even if those three things are as simple as I got up, I breathed, I fed myself, huzzah, movement forward, fan fucking tastic, do it. So this is the thing is we get stuck in this thing about, oh my God, I know how to fail, but I don't know how to succeed. So it's really, really important to start training yourself to succeed and give yourself permission. So when you are doing the mirror work, when you are working on yourself, because let's face it, guys, everything, literally everything boils down to self-esteem, which means self-respect, which means self-love, self-kindness, self-gentleness. That's what that all means. It's not some nebulous kind of, oh, I don't know what self-esteem is. It's how you treat you. So we sabotage ourselves on so many different levels, but people with self-esteem don't. People with self-esteem don't put up with abuse from anybody, themselves included. So when I say you got to get the self-esteem workbook by Sherelda, you got to do the mirror work. You got to, because if you don't, you're not going to move anywhere. You're going to stay stuck. You're going to stay stuck and you're not going to get it by osmosis. This is the thing. You can come into therapy and you can sit there and piss and whine and moan for years. But if you're not doing the work, you're not going to get better. You got to do the work. And the work is what is scary because now we're having to come up against. Now, here's here's one scenario that I really want to talk about. If we had parental units that were abusive, that were narcissists, that were borderline, that were narcissists, that were neglectful, addicted, uh, you know, just checked out, not there, whatever. If we had a parent that was abusive, right? And they shoved all of their stuff, projected onto us, told us all sorts of bullshit, right? We started developing who we think we are based off of them, we become adults, we get into abusive relationships, whatever. And then when we go to work on confronting that original wound, that parent, that parental unit, all of that projection, all of that crap, that's not true. It is terrifying. And the inner child will literally do somersaults to avoid confronting the original betrayal. Let me just let that sink in for a second. We are terrified of the original betrayal. We were betrayed. That parental unit, that one that was addicted, that one that was abusive, that one that was neglectful, that one that was harmful, that one that projected everything onto you, the one who looked at you and said, when you were crying in the grocery store, mommy, mommy, I want chocolate. No, you don't. You don't want chocolate. The one who started telling you you didn't know what you wanted, that one, confronting that betrayal huge, terrifying, terrifying, because now we are coming up against our basic assumption. Who are we in the universe? And our first clue of who we are is given to us by our caregivers. And if our caregiver is fucked up and dysfunctional, that's a terrifying proposition because now we are into existentialism. Who I am I? Who am I? Who am I? Who am I in this universe? What do I mean? What does my existence mean? And that's scary. And that is terrifying to a two-year-old. Does that make sense? So this is why you have people, and we do this. We all do this. We all fucking do this. That put off recovery, don't stop using substances, don't take care of themselves, don't go to therapy, 
Don't do the work because we are trying desperately to avoid the real issue, which is the original betrayal from the parental unit. It's terrifying. I went through it, guys. If you read my effing book, I talk about it. I did it in my teens and my 20s, okay? Because I knew there was something desperately wrong with my family. Like, really? And it was heart breaking. It was heart wrenching. It was an existential crisis. You betcha. I don't think a whole lot of people talk about this. I really don't. And they really fucking should. So when we go into recovery from anything, whether it is a substance, because that's only a symptom of what the deeper issue is. If you are drinking and drugging, you are trying to cover something up. Same thing if we're trying to cover something up, if we've got a dysfunctional family. So what we don't hear or what we don't talk about a lot is the existential crisis that happens when we confront that original betrayal and that original emotional abandonment. Bam. It's going to happen, guys. You are going to be questioning your existence. You're going to be questioning who you are in this universe. You're going to be questioning, does anybody love me? You're going to be questioning, why am I here? Oh my God, am I going to die alone? You're going to be questioning all of this stuff. And it is terrifying. It is. So congratulations, you're human. You're having a real genuine emotion and you're thinking about deeper things than any abuser ever will because abusers don't go that deep. So do you see where I'm going with that? So congratulations, the terror is telling you you're on the right fucking path. Don't stop. Keep going forward. You will get through it, but you won't get through it if you throw down your hands and stand there and go, eh, it's too scary. Eh, I don't want to do it. Eh, I'm just going to stay right here. Do you know what's going to happen? You're going to get stuck. And if you get stuck, the people around you are going to get really fucking pissed off. They are because they're going to be like, what are you doing? What the fuck? Keep moving forward. Stop being a victim. Move forward. Move forward. Move forward. So he who hesitates is lost. This is the thing. We hesitate. We all do. I did. Everybody I know does. We hesitate because we don't trust. And I cannot teach you trust. All I can tell you is listen to your gut. Don't listen to your heart. Don't listen to your head. Listen to your gut. That's where your trust is. That's your intuition. That is our second brain, quite literally. And I cannot teach you to trust. But this is the thing. We get into the middle of it and we freak out and we stop trusting. And the first person we stop trusting, boom, 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 ourselves. So it's really important to work on self-esteem with a goddamn good therapist who understands this shit, who gets that it's terrifying, who gets that you're going to be stuck occasionally because the two-year-old is, is having a temper tantrum, who gets that it is an existential crisis when we leave an abuser. It is because now we have to go back and figure out who was the original abuser. Where did we get abandoned first? Who betrayed us the first time? Who was the original betrayer? And that's what's terrifying because really realizing that that parental unit did not have your back, did not love us, did not really have our best interest at heart. That's terrifying. That is terrifying. It is when you really realize it and you go, shit, they didn't have my best interest at heart. They weren't looking out for me. They were looking out for themselves. Fuck. You know, it's terrifying. It is. And it brings up all sorts of emotions. And if we are with or have been raised by abusers, we don't know how to deal with emotions. Why? Because abusers do not allow us to have anything other than happy, happy, joy, joy. And it's a fake happy, happy, joy, joy, because if we're really happy, happy, joy, joy, they make sure we're not happy. They're, they don't want us to have any real emotion. They don't want us to be angry. They don't want us to be sad. They don't want us to be questioning our existence. They don't want anything that isn't convenient for them. Do you see where I'm going with that? So yeah, there is going to be a ton of emotions that you are going to have as you are leaving your abuse, as you are working on yourself, self-esteem. Let's talk about that. The interesting thing about every single last one of us is that we treat everybody else with kindness and love and respect and joy and and empathy but we are so goddamn mean to ourselves that shit has got to stop it does i want you guys to treat you the way you treat everybody else we all put ourselves on the back burner we do not put ourselves first and we come up with every excuse in the book as to why we cannot 
take good care of ourselves because we feel it's selfish. Ooh, gee, wonder who told us that? That would be the original abuser, or that would be the abuser we dated, or that would be the abuser we married. It would be an abuser, or that would be that boss, or that would be that best friend. See where I'm going with that? Let me clue you into something. Self-care is not selfish. Self-care does not involve harming somebody to make you feel better. Now that's selfish, but taking care of yourself, making sure your batteries are recharged, that you're happy with yourself, that you love yourself, that you are good to yourself, that you are respectful of yourself, that's self-care. All the things that you do for other people, do it for you. Do it for you first. It's just like I keep saying, it's like being in the airplane when they say, you know, if the mask drops, put your own mask on first and then turn and help somebody else because otherwise you're going to keel over. It's the same thing. Really, really start recognizing you are worthy of your own love, your own time, and your own attention. And we don't do that. And this is why we self-sabotage because we don't think we're worthy. We treat ourselves last. We, we don't even think about taking care of ourselves. And I'll clue you into something else. Abusers don't ever want their targets to go to therapy. They don't ever want their targets to read self-help books. They don't ever want their targets to journal. They don't ever want their targets to fill in the blank because they don't want their targets to heal and they don't want their targets to get strong and they don't want their targets to leave them because that is exactly what will happen once we start getting our own sense of self. So we sabotage in so many different ways. We sabotage by either, you know, not taking care of ourselves, not doing the work, or we sabotage by allowing that fear of that original abandonment to stop us from really confronting that original abuser. Whoever that original abuser was, whether it was a family member or whether it was a boss or whether, it, and I don't mean confronting, like calling him up and going, George, you're a real dick. No, you're not going to do that. What I mean is really working through that emotion of, holy shit, that parental unit did not have my back. That parental unit really was all about them. That parental unit could care less, couldn't care less. It's not could care less. It's couldn't care less. Couldn't care less what happened as long as they got taken care of. Wow. Ouch. Damn. That's hurtful. That's painful. That's scary. And so we allow that fear to stop us from really pursuing that. And do you know exactly what needs to happen? You need to really pursue that. You need to really get angry with that parental unit. You need to get really sad. You need to really work it out. You need to go through all of the emotions and recognize it's not you. It's them. It's not you. It's them. You're not the defective one. I'm sorry, babies pop out of the womb, right? And a normal parental unit loves them unconditionally, unfucking conditionally, no strings attached. A fucked up dysfunctional family unit, however, the child pops out and, oh, you've got this job, you've got that job, and I will love you if, and if you make me happy, I'll love you, and if you do this, I'll love you, and if you do that, I'll love you, and if you did it, do you see where I'm going with that? So you got to get mad at that parental unit. You got to allow yourself to feel the hurt. You've got to allow yourself to fucking feel. If you can't feel it, you're not going to fucking heal it. And what will end up happening is, is that little inner three-year-old, inner two-year-old, inner teen, inner young adult, whatever age it was that the original abuse occurred, is going to be the one running the show. That's going to be your subconscious. I don't know about you, but I really don't want two-year-old Chris running the show. I really don't. I really don't. I love two-year-old Chris. Two-year-old Chris is awesome. I think she's adorable. However, that is not who I want making decisions in the world. Not banking decisions, not relationship decisions. Not a good idea. Do you see where I'm going with this, guys? You have got to grow the inner child up. If you don't, you are constantly going to find yourself in this repetitive, oh, what was it? Groundhog Day of... Gee, why do I keep dating abusers? Gee, why do I keep going to bad jobs? Gee, why do I keep having friends that betray me? Gee, why do I keep doing... Do you see where I'm going with this, guys? It's because you're playing out the same thing over and over and again, trying to fix the original wound without actually fixing the original wound. We keep going to people who remind us of the abuser, and we do not ever work on the real fucking issue. That is why we sabotage. 
Holy cow, what time is it? Okay, I got a little bit more time. All right, so and at 1230, I'm going to go for questions. So um, so if you got questions, start asking them. Um, okay, oh, and here's the other thing. If you are uh, putting stuff up in a foreign language, we're just going to delete it, guys, because, you know, it, if I don't know if you're saying something nice or something nasty, and we don't have time to translate it, so it's just going to get deleted. So please be respectful. Please don't say anything stupid, and, and you won't get deleted, basically. Um but if you're putting it up in a foreign language, no, I, I'm not going to subject my listeners to any trash that's been coming in through, you know, other languages. So, cause that's happened and that's not okay. So, um, all right. All right. So here we go. So what ends up happening is, is if you find yourself in a repetitive Bill Murray groundhog day of the same shit happening just differently, but still happening over and over and over again, it is because your two-year-old or your inner child is running the show. You have not dealt with the original wound, which means you really, really, really need to confront that fear. Stop having the temper tantrums. Comfort your inner child when it does. Yeah, you're right. I don't want to do this. No, this is not fun. Yeah, this scares the fucking shit out of me. You bet. God, I really don't want to do this, but you know what? We're going to do it. And you know what? You're safe and it's okay. And I'm going to protect you and everything's going to be all, all right. It's going to be fine. We'll get through this. Mommy or daddy is not going to punish us because they're not going to know we're working on it. They're not. Now, if they knew you were working on it, I'm pretty sure they would punish you, but don't fucking tell them you work on you. You do you. Do you see where I'm going with that? So, you know, this is the other thing. Oh, <laughs> this is another way that people sabotage. They tell their abuser what they're doing. Stop it. You're looking for approval. You're looking for acceptance. You're looking for this person to say, oh my God, I could have had a V8. I was wrong. You know, you were right. And, and I'm a terrible person. I need to work on myself. And it wasn't you. It was me. That's never going to happen, guys. That is never going to happen. Never. Not on this planet Earth. Not on any other planet Earth. Not in this solar system. Not in any other solar system. It ain't going to happen. So this is why you've got to stop sabotaging yourself because again, who's writing that letter? Who's writing that email? That would be the inner child. That would be the two-year-old looking for approval. I want mommy to approve of me. I want daddy to approve of me. Stop it, guys. You're never going to get what you need from an abuser. That is like going to a well that is dry or it has salt in it or poisoned more likely. So stop it. Stop it. Stop looking for approval outside of yourself. That is other esteem. Self-esteem is just that tiny little voice inside that says, hey, I like you. Hey, you're a good person. Oops, you fucked up. Okay, make amends. Keep going. Did you make amends? Good, you did. All right, forgive yourself. Move on. That's self-esteem. Other esteem looks like this. And when we rely on somebody else to tell us who the fuck we are, guess what? If they go away, we go kathunk. No bueno. If we are standing on our own and they are standing on their own, we can come together. We can kind of weeble wobble. And if they go away, we weeble wobble and we're fine. Does that make sense? So there is that. All right. So I hope that explains why we are sabotaged. Why do we go back to the abuser? Because we keep expecting a different outcome. We keep thinking, if I can just explain it, if I can just show them who I am, they'll see, they'll get me. They'll get it. They'll understand. They'll apologize. They'll straighten up and fly right. They'll stop cheating. They'll whatever. Uh-uh. It ain't going to happen. That is called magic thinking. And that is what kids do. So kids have got magic thinking. Magic thinking is where a little kid is laying in bed and they pull the blanket up over their head and they go, well, okay, if the monster can't see me or if I can't see the monster, the monster can't see me. That's magic thinking. If I, you know, if I can't see the monster, the monster can't see me. Well, obviously the monster's going to see a lump in bed, but you know, that's, that's magic thinking. Well, if I just say it this way, it'll be better. That's magic thinking. Uh, if I can just prove to them that I'm love worthy, that's magic thinking. They can't, they can't see their own worth, let alone yours. People treat us the way that they think about themselves. Now the narcissist will do all sorts of stuff for themselves, like stuff. Stuff. They'll buy themselves stuff. They'll do stuff. They'll stuff, stuff, stuff. But the stuff that's going on in their head is vicious, mean, nasty, awful, horrible, terrible, not enough, too much, not enough, too much. And that's what we get slammed with. Well, you're too sensitive. You're too this. You're too that. You're not, you're not thin enough. You're not glamorous enough. You're not sexy enough. You're not tall enough. You're not short enough. You're not, not enough, too much. That's how they think about themselves. And yet they spew it over us and we fucking believed them. 
So they're never going to change guys. They are never, you cannot change a narcissist. I don't care what any other person on the web says. You cannot change a narcissist. They're not going to change. And to become like the narcissist is exactly what they want. They want everyone to act just like them so that they can justify their own vile behavior. Don't do it. Rise above. Work on you. Work on self-esteem. Get the self-esteem workbook by Glenn Schiraldi. Get radical acceptance by Tara Brock. Get radical forgiveness by Colin Tipping. And everybody gets their panties in a bunch. Oh my God, I'm not going to forgive them. Burr, 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 burr. Okay. Uh, Buddha, Buddhist, Buddha, <laughs> Buddhist here. Uh, picking up anger is, you know, wanting to revenge and wanting to harm and wanting to carry anger around is like picking up two hot coals and tending to throw them at somebody else. The only person that's getting hurt is you. The best thing you can do for a narcissist is ignore them. You know why? Because <laughs> they hate that. Live your life, live well. The best revenge is living well. The best revenge is the best you. Be better than them, which means love yourself. Really, to the core, love who you are. Be secure in who you are because then you will be absolutely bulletproof to any and all abusers. And that's why abusers want us to become them. They want us to get down in the mud with them and become manipulative and become liars and become unfaithful and become, do you see where I'm going with that? Because that's what they do. And so they accuse us of doing what they do. And if they can't, then they try to tell us, well, we need to be just like them. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No, sir, Rebob. You rise above. You be honorable. You be filled with self-esteem, self-worth, self-knowing, self-love, self-respect, self-kindness. Live well. Have ice cream. <laughs> you know? All right. I am going to take questions. So... All right. Uh, how do I overcome the negative voices and undermining behaviors from relatives? You get rid of them. Flying monkeys, guys. Let's let's talk about that. When we get out of a, a negative relationship, an abusive relationship, whether it is a romantic relationship or a family, familial relationship or whatever, we're going to start cleaning out our closet. And it is going to feel like, oh, my God, we don't have anybody. Well, yeah, because if it's the family that we're cleaning out, I can guarantee you if there's one that's disordered, there's probably more. So you got to get rid of all of the flying monkeys. All of them. So there are two ways you can do it. Hang on just a second. So two ways you can do it. One, you can go low contact. So if you don't want to break contact completely, you can go low contact, meaning you contact on your terms, you work on you in between, and you go gray rock whenever you have to have contact with them. So gray rock is when you don't give them anything. You don't give them any emotion. Remember, these guys are looking to poke the bear, poke the bear, poke the bear, poke the bear. Why? Because they want to hear the bear go, Rawr. okay? That's what they're looking for. They're looking for the bear to roar back. And then they can go, oh, did you see how he roared? Back? Oh, did, he's cray cray. Oh my God. And then now they've got all their gossip. Okay. So you want to go gray rock. Gray rock is, I don't know if you guys have ever watched a Kung Fu movie, but there's always the Zen master. There's always the master who teaches like Jackie Chan or Jet Li or whatever. And they, you know, they're calm. Like no matter what crap is coming at them, no matter if they know they're going to die, they're totally calm. They're totally calm. And they don't give the abuser, the attacker, any emotion at all. None. Uh-huh. 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 Hmm. Uh-huh. Nothing. Nothing. Gee, look at the time. Gotta go. And is that going to drive the abuser crazy? Yeah. Will it make them react? Oh, yeah. But they're also going to look like the crazy one because they're the ones roaring and you can just kind of sit back and go, hmm, isn't that interesting? Oh, look at that little vein popping out on the side of their neck. Yeah. Detachment, guys. Detachment. Abusers are liars. Abusers would not know the truth if it walked up and did the Watusi with them. Okay. So let them, let them come unglued, let them self-destruct. The whole thing about Kung Fu is you do not ever attack your attacker. You allow your attacker's energy to take them to the floor. You allow them to destroy themselves basically is what it is. So it's really, it's learning to stop reacting and it's learning to do gray rock, which is you don't give them anything. You give them nothing. They've got nothing. Well, why are you doing that? Da -da 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 -da. 
Oh, sorry you feel that way. A little bit of their own medicine, but in a good way. Okay. It's not like you're, it's not like you're doing it to necessarily poke them, but you're doing it to, for self-preservation so that they've got nothing so that they cannot come at you. Right. So gray rock, that is what gray rock is, is you just do no emotion. It's uh-huh. 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 I gotta go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. You feel that way. Uh-huh. No emotion, none. And then you go low contact. Now, if the family is toxic and harmful and hurtful, and they're just all up in your business and stuff, you go no contact. That means you delete them from Facebook. You delete them from all social media. You get rid of them. You have no contact with them. You don't do anything with them. If they call, you're busy unless it's on your terms. And this is the thing that I hear a lot is like, but I feel so guilty. I feel so guilty. I feel so guilty. So let me clue you in guys. Healthy relationships do not have fear, obligation, or guilt. It doesn't. It doesn't. You hang out with somebody because you want to. You're with somebody because you want to. You are doing things because you want to. You enjoy their company. And if you don't, you are under no obligation to talk to them. And I don't care who the fuck they think they are. So if it's an elderly parent that has been abusive and is continuing to be abusive and is trying to control and manipulate, you are under no obligation to be around them. If you were not related to these people, would you have anything to do with them? And if the answer is no, act accordingly. There you go. So how do you overcome the negative voices? It is working on self-esteem and it is doing mirror work and it is writing and journaling and doing positive affirmations for yourself in the mirror. When we look in the mirror and people say, oh, I don't like what I see. Mm -mm. It's not that you don't like what you see. You don't like what you hear because you're saying something mean to you. I can guarantee it. So when you look in the mirror, you want to make eye contact with yourself and you want to say, hi, good to see you. Have a great day. Hey, I give you permission to get rid of all the flying monkeys or whatever it is you're working on. Or, hey, I give you permission to like yourself. Or, hey, I give you permission to say the nice things to you. That kind of thing. Because we have to give ourselves permission because we're talking to that inner two-year-old. So if we had a non-permission non parent, we're going to have to give ourselves permission. We have to re-raise ourselves. So there is that. So that's how you start with that. Get with a good therapist. Get with a really good therapist that's going to help you through this cleaning out period, this existential who the fuck am I period. Get with a good therapist. Start being nice to you. Be your own advocate. Be your best advocate. What do advocates say? They say nice things. They encourage, they support, they lift up. They don't harm, they don't put down. And if you listen, really listen to the bullshit going on in our heads, to that interior dialogue, and it's coming from family, it's going to be a combination of either not good enough, oh, you're not good enough, you're too this, you're too that, you're not good enough, you're da 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 da, da. or it's going to be, oh my God, what if, oh my God, what if, oh my God, what if, you know, do you see where I'm going with that? So both of those, you have to say, thank you for your input, shut the fuck up, why? Because I say so, you say so, you're the boss. I say so, I am good enough, and I refuse to live in a future that has not and probably will not happen. So fuck you very much, not doing it, thanks, Bye bye that's what you do. Constant. It's constant. You've got to put these thoughts down like a rabid goddamn raccoon or dog or rabid animal, whatever. Do you see where I'm going with that? So there that is. So it's working on the interior dialogue. It's working on the self-esteem and boundaries. It's the codependency. It is not our job to make these unpleasable fuckers happy because they never will be. Never. It's too much. Not enough. Too much. Not enough. Too much. And you can't work with that. So you got to work on the disease to please by Harriet Breaker, the inner child workbook by Catherine Taylor, the self-esteem workbook by Glenn Schiraldi, the CPTSD from surviving to thriving by Pete Walker, uh, radical acceptance by Tara Brock and uh, radical forgiveness by Colin Tipping. Do it. You're worth it. You're worth it. And don't give me the bullshit that you don't have time. Bullshit. Bull fucking shit. If y'all got time to go to fucking Starbucks, y'all got time to work on yourself. Mm, it's a matter of priorities. What is your priority? Mm? Are you a priority in your life? Make yourself a priority in your life. All right, there it is. It feels as though I am only happy with the presence of others. And when I'm by myself, I feel empty. Common, common. So when we do not have a parental unit to teach us how to, we don't know how. That's what I'm telling you. Get all these books. Start doing the positive affirmations. 
There is so much more to you than you even realize. There is so much amazing to you than you know. Now is the time to find out who you really are by yourself. Other people do not define us. They tell us who we are and we can either believe them or not, but we really need to know who we are. Who are you? I, I cannot tell you the joy I feel when I get letters or IMs or whatever from somebody who's like, oh my God, I took myself out to lunch all by myself. Didn't go with anybody. Really enjoyed my own company. Do you want to know what I was thinking? I was thinking how beautiful the day was and how much I like myself and how good the food tasted. And all of these things that we don't pay attention to because we're so up here listening to this. Does that make sense? So it really is going to be a matter of working on the self-esteem workbook. Work on you. Get with a good therapist. Find your value. You've got value. You do. We are all children of the universe. We are. And we're all just walking each other home. So go find who you are. And you're going to find it's amazing. If you've survived a narcissistic, abusive relationship, you're a fucking warrior, man. You know, we all are. It's terrifying. You, you show me a warrior, I'll tell you somebody, show you somebody that was terrified to the core before they marched through that fire. You bet. It's terrifying. It's terrifying to get clean and sober. It is. And it's terrifying to get clean and sober off of an abusive relationship as well. But there is worth to you. There is worth to everybody. Eh, maybe not the abusers, but <laughs> there is worth to every survivor. Eh, there's actually worth to the abusers because we learned the lesson. So the point being is find your worth. Find who you are. Enjoy the moment. Live in the here and the now. What we tend to do as addicts, because remember, we are just as addicted to the abuser as any heroin addict is to heroin. And what we tend to do as addicts is that we live either in a future that has not and probably will not happen, or we're living in the past. And we're not living right here, right now. Why? Because of the nasty things that we say to ourselves. And that shit has got to stop. You want to get better? Shut this the fuck down replace it with the here and the now. So what I do with my clients when they're like really in it and they're like, Oh, the past, Oh, the future, Oh, the past, Oh, the future. Stop. Take a deep breath. How many green things are in this room right here, right now? There's a lot of green in my office. So getting them back to the present moment, touch the wall. What is the texture? Tell me what the texture is. So it's a matter of getting us back into the present. We got to live in the here and the now. This is the only moment we have. This is this moment, this moment, this moment. Make the most of it. Enjoy taking yourself out to lunch. Enjoy telling yourself nice things. Give yourself permission. It's okay. All right. There is that. Um, why is it so difficult to be able to care, to be with myself and care for myself? Because of whatever messages you got. So write this stuff down and challenge it. If you can, write down the negative stuff. And then in the next column, challenge it. Tell it to fuck itself sideways with an unlubricated baseball bat. That's what you do. You constantly are going, nope, I'm not doing it. Nope, I'm not. It's called thought stopping. So when these thoughts pop up, now this is different from resisting. So with resisting, what we tend to do is a thought pops up. We're not even really aware of it. And we go, oh my God, I don't want to think about that. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking. It doesn't exist. La, 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 denial. Hello. And what are we thinking about the whole time? We're thinking about that one thought. Thought stopping is where you go, Oh, well, look at that. Mm -hmm. My abusive parents said X, Y, and Z about me. Is it true? No, it's not. You know what? Fuck you, asshole. I don't have to believe it. And you get to go bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. 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 And you send it on down the road. So it's thought stopping and replacing. And you replace with either, I don't get to, I don't have to believe this. I don't have to believe this bullshit. We had to believe it when we were little. Yeah, because our parents filled our head with it. But we don't have to believe it as an adult. And that's what we have to keep telling our inner child. It's like, I don't have to believe their bullshit. I don't. So that's why it's so hard because it's it's been a habit. And so we have to undo the habit and then replace it with the positive stuff, positive affirmations. That's what you want to do. All right. When I was in a relationship, I denied that all the abuse was happening. I left. And now I only remember the abuse. Why is this? Well, oh boy. So when we're in an abusive relationship, whether it is a romantic relationship, whether it is a parental relationship, a job relationship or whatever, we do, we go into denial and it's, um, it's an ego defense. It's, it's one of the ego defenses. This is a way that we survive. If we go, Oh no, 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 it's not that bad. Oh no, 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 no. That's not really happening. Oh no, 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 no. I'm just going to minimize it. It's a way for us to survive. 
So denial does have its place, but the problem of it is, is that we get stuck in denial and we keep making excuses for the abuser and we keep not admitting that the abuse really is as bad as it is, et cetera. So, um, yeah. And we, if the inner child is protecting the abuser, then that makes me wonder what happened originally? What's the original wound? Who are you really protecting? So that's something else to take a look at. There's a reason we defend the abuser to the death because it reminds us of our original abuser. So that's why we got to figure out what is the original wound? Because if you do not fix this original wound, you're going to bleed all over people that did not cut you. Let me just say that again. If you do not fix this original wound, you are going to bleed all over the people that did not cut you. And you don't want that. So um, it is, and then now you only remember the abuse and that's fine because I don't want you taking a walk down memory lane and going, Oh, remember when the primroses led to the trail to hell? No, I don't want you doing that. I need you to remember the abuse. I do. I need you to remember the abuse and don't ever let it happen again. Okay. <laughs> Cause you're worth more than that. So it's common. It's an ego defense. It's common. And now you're only remembering the abuse. And that's probably a good thing because you don't want to go back to the abuser. What ends up happening, like I said, is that inner child takes over and starts running the show. And pretty soon we're doing the whole memory lane thing where it's all good memories. And the next thing, you know, the Hoover happens. And the next thing, you know, you're walking into their apartment. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't, don't do it. Frenchie, not a good idea. Don't do it. So there is that. Um, okay. I feel so guilty for being myself, which is stopping me from living my life. How do I accept my sexuality when I've been hiding it all my life? Oh, bunny, no hiding your sexuality. No, no, you are you. And it is okay. So it, it is, oh boy, this is going to get deeper than I thought. All right, here we go. Narcissists and malignant borderlines tend to be homophobes. They do. Okay. They cannot cope with their own thoughts, which is why they spew them all over everybody else. And if they are homophobic, it is probably because they have feelings along those lines that they are not coping with and not acknowledging and not admitting. And so it's easier to just make somebody else hide themselves. You know, it's like, don't you, I have actually heard a narcissistic parent say, Oh, if you come out of the closet, I will disown you. I'm sorry. What the fuck kind of parent does that bullshit? Hmm? Not a good one. Tell you that right now. You love your kid. Doesn't fucking matter. Doesn't fucking matter. If you don't agree with them, that's one thing. That's great. Fine. Whatever. But you still love your child. No matter what their sexuality is, no matter what their gender is, no matter whether they're whatever. You know, there's so many terms now. I don't even know. But the point being is they're your child. You fucking love them. Period. Exclamation point. There we go. So your sexuality is perfectly okay. It is who you are. Stop hiding. You don't need to hide. And it has to do with self-esteem and it has to do with the shame that we got about our own sexuality. So I'm heterosexual, but my crazy parents made me feel so guilty over being a sexual creature that I was constantly told, Oh, don't you dare. Don't you dare. Don't you, don't you be sensual. Don't you be sexual. Don't you be this. You're a slut. You're a whore. You're this. You're, mm -hmm, I was a virgin until I was 22 motherfuckers. So the point being is, because of them. Fuck you. So the point being is, is that they shame us for sexuality because they can't fucking deal with it. They can't deal with it. It's not that we can't deal with it. They can't deal with it. So really explore your sexuality. Get with a good therapist. Don't hide anymore. You don't need to. And your tribe will accept you. The ones who don't accept you are not your tribe. That's all there is to it. So I hope that that answers your question. And how do you accept it? You give yourself permission. You know, if you're gay, if you're lesbian, if you're bi, if you're pansexual or whatever, it's like you give yourself permission. You just be like, this is who I am and I'm okay with it. And you do the mirror work and you work with a good therapist that's LBGTQ friendly. Okay. So there that is. Um, question. Is it normal when you are trying to build yourself up? There are people that try to manipulate and control you. Yes. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay. So here's the deal. So when we start changing, what ends up happening is, is all of the people who are not changing or who in, are invested in us not changing, try to force us back into our previous role. So if it is a dysfunctional workplace, if it is a dysfunctional family, if it is a dysfunctional, whatever, hold on a second. All of the other people that have been put into these little boxes, 
So for example, golden child, ignored middle child, uh, comedic younger child, really dysfunctional families, second mom, second dad, um, really, really dysfunctional families, second wife, second husband, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of those people are invested in, if you're the scapegoat, you not getting healthy. Because once the scapegoat or any of these roles start figuring it the fuck out and go, oh, oh, no, I'm going to work on myself. I'm going to get strong. I'm going to do that. They are going to sabotage, 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 because they want you to go back to your role. Because if you don't, that means the abuser is going to have to find another scapegoat or another golden child or another whatever fill in the blank. So yeah, there are going to be a whole bunch of people around you that are going to try to keep you from growing, keep you from changing, keep you from going to therapy. I'm sorry, anybody who refuses to allow you to go to therapy, ginormous red flag. They don't want you to change. They don't want you to grow. They don't want you to see them for the piece of shit that they really are. Big flag, big, huge red flag. All right. So there is that. So yes, they will. How do you protect yourself? You get rid of them. They, get, they start, I'll tell you what, I played life like a baseball game. Three strikes and you're fucking out. You know, you show me who you are, I'll believe you the first fucking time. I'm not going to wait around to be abused. I'm not. I've done that in my, in my younger years. I'm too old for this shit. I'm not doing that anymore. You show me who you are and I will believe you the first time. So now, do people make mistakes? Yes, but you have to trust your gut. So again, am I trusting my gut or am I listening to my head and heart? So if somebody makes a mistake and makes a true, sincere amends for it and they never do it again, okay, good. I Now you, you again have showed me who you really are. Okay, great. But if they fuck up and they make a fake apology and then they do it again, ha, huh, guess what? They have really shown you who they are. Hmm, there it is. So you protect yourself by self-esteem. It all boils down to self-esteem. That's really what it is. Good boundaries are part of self-esteem. Being Free of codependency is having good self-esteem because you have good boundaries, because you know who you are, because you're not going to allow every Tom, Dick, and Harry into your space. You're just not. So yeah, and you start getting rid of all the flying monkeys. You get rid of the people who are manipulating and controlling you. And and what you can do, it, you know, if you want to try to salvage the relationship, you can say, hey, this is not working. I'm feeling controlled. Would you be interested in going to therapy with me to work on this relationship? And if they say no, fuck you, be done be done. Y'all don't have time for that. You've got bigger and better things to do. And you got your tribe to find. So there it is. All right. Question. Social media is a problem. I am so conditioned to tell everything that I'm doing for myself. Any practical advice to retrain myself? Oh, this is huge, guys. So here's the deal. Abusers train us to tell them everything. Everything. Nobody around an abuser has privacy ever. They don't. They don't because the abuser demands that everything that they know everything because in their sick, twisted, fucked up minds, if they know everything, they can control everything. So that is why you never tell your abuser jack shit. If you're planning on leaving the relationship, hold on. So we get trained. So who was the first person that trained you? Who trained you to say everything? So less is more on social media. You know, less is more. So if you go to my LPC page, I post political views. I post sometimes Victorian dresses or Victorian houses, lots of dogs, because that's my thing. I like dogs. I like Victorian houses. I like dresses. So, and, and I like politics. I do. Um, and as long as people are respectful, I'm, I'm cool with opposing views. But, you know, if you start calling me names, you're going to be booted right the fuck off. So you don't overshare on social media. If you notice, I don't really share a whole lot about me and John. I don't say, oh, hey, we're going here. or Hey, we've done this. You know, occasionally I will, but not very often. And the reason why is, is because y'all don't need to know that shit. And you're all on a need to know basis. And that's the thing. We get trained by the abuser to just ver verbally vomit. We do. We get trained to say all of this stuff that is really nobody's fucking business. But we've been trained. So the way to untrain it is when you think about posting something, stop. Stop. And put it through these gates. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Is it intuitive? I left out intuitive. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it intuitive? Is it necessary? And is it kind? And is it going to further the universe? 
you know? If it's not, don't post it. Pretty simple, you know? So you don't have to sell everything that you're doing for yourself. You don't. You know, who are you trying to prove it to? Who are you trying to impress? Who are you trying to say, look at me, look at me, look at me, I'm taking care of myself. Who are you trying to show that they're wrong? That's what I see a lot in social media is that um, an abuser will harm somebody and then we get out of that abusive relationship and then we want to show them how great we're doing. They don't care. Newsflash. They don't give two rats asses how we're doing. If they did, they wouldn't have treated us the way they did. So really, it's like, really put it through the gates of, do I need to say this or not? And who, who am I trying to impress? There you go. Think about it. And then journal it and figure it out and get with a good therapist and work on self-esteem. Work on self-esteem. Okay. Um, how do I know if my therapist is a good therapist to help me overcome self-sabotage? Are you making progress? Are you growing? Now, there are times when you can have a good therapist and not be making progress because you not doing the work. So it's going to have to be a matter of you really sitting down, having a coming to Jesus meeting with yourself. Am I doing the work? Am I working the workbooks? Am I doing the letter writing and burning? Am I doing the things I need to be doing in order to progress? Or am I just coming in and sitting on the couch and going, way, 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 poor me. And if you're doing the way, 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 poor me, you're never going to get better. So it really, Therapists, I saw a John Ritter movie once. I loved it. I can't remember the name of it. I want to say Pretty in Pink, but that's not Pretty in Pink. That was a John Hughes movie. Um, it was John Ritter, and he was an alcoholic, and he had a therapist. And so he came in, and he was complaining and complaining and complaining. And he looks at the, the psychiatrist or the psychologist or whatever it was, and he says, well, I'm not getting any better, and, and you're not helping, and da-da-da-da-da. And he's like, look, I have no answers. I only have suggestions. <laughs> You know, and that's true. Therapists have no answers. We have suggestions. We do. It's like, try this, do this. And so if you're not trying this and doing that, you're not going to get better. You know, you're just not. So if you're moving forward and if you're doing the work, then you're with a good therapist. If you're, if your therapist is allowing you to sit on that couch for years and piss and whine and moan, and not do the work and not call you on it, then it's your therapist is the problem. And you're the problem too for, you know, not doing the work. But, you know, the thing of it is, is you can call the person on, on the fact that they're not doing the work and they may still just keep coming back and complaining, you know, but I always tell them, it's like, okay, why are you wasting your money? Why are you continuing to come back if you're not doing the work? I don't understand what you're getting out of this. What are you getting out of this? And usually that kicks them into gear. So, so yeah, so you just, you want to know that you're doing the work and your therapist is not allowing you to stay in victimhood. It drives me crazy when I see therapists that are like either, you know, I'm the guru on the mountain. I know everything. I knew better than you, which is a load of shit because clients in, intuitively know how to heal themselves, but they just need the pieces of the puzzle put together. And they can do that if you help them, if you give them the right suggestions. They can put the pieces together and figure it out themselves and heal themselves. That's really what a good therapist does. So I hate the therapists that are like, oh, I'm the guru on the mountain. I have all the answers and blah, 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 bull fucking shit. Nobody has all the answers. So, you know, and then that's the other thing is like, or you get the therapist that are the blank screen therapists that don't ever say anything fucking helpful and go, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. How do you feel about that? Oh, mm -hmm. our time is up. That'll be $3,000 billion. Okay. So it, it is a matter of, are you moving forward? Are you stuck? Are you doing the work? Is your therapist kicking your ass to make sure you're doing the work? What's the deal? If you're not moving forward, then you're probably with the wrong therapist if you are doing the work or if you are not doing the work and they're not kicking your ass. Does that make sense? I hope that made sense. Okay. All right. Boom. I think that's enough for one day. Holy cow. So to recap very quickly, self-sabotage comes directly out of low self-esteem. People who love themselves do not stay stuck, live in victimhood, allow themselves to be abused, abuse drugs, alcohol, or anything else. They move themselves forward. They have good boundaries and they work on themselves every day, every day, every day, every day. And we make time for ourselves every day, every damn day. I work on myself every day, every day without fail. 
I do mirror work every day. Every day. I practice what I fucking preach. So you got to work on you. You've got to be responsible for you. You have got to be willing to trust your gut, to listen to your gut, to do the self-esteem work, to do the boundary work, to become the best you you possibly can. And that's going to piss off your abuser more than anything else. So there it is. All right. So basically self-sabotage boils down to you will not self-sabotage if you are working on yourself, if you are doing the self-esteem, if you have got good self-esteem, and if you're doing the work, and if you're willing to confront that original abuse, that original fear, that original wound, that original betrayal. So there it is. All right, my loves, I'm going to go have a wonderful, wonderful week. And um, I'm not quite sure what next week's. Oh, actually, you know, I've had a lot of questions on social anxiety. And so how we feel very frightened after getting out of an abusive relationship and how to start socializing, filling up that that tribe uh, closet again and all that sort of good stuff. All right. So there it is. All right, my loves have a great week and I will talk to you later. Bye.